questioning and following the evidence is the pathway to the future. That is how we've gotten as far as we have as, as a species, and it's a good thing. And asking deep questions is, is, is valuable. And um, the other thing I would say is, you know, as, as, as I said earlier, the divisions between groups of people that seem really important are artificial and minute compared to what we share. And if we have the perspective of, of the pale blue dot of, of zooming out, we can realize that we are all in it together. And we're so, so, so astonishingly similar that if anyone came from the outside, they would not be able to detect the differences that we seem to think are very important. Sasha Sagan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sasha has worked as a television producer, filmmaker, editor, writer, and speaker in the U.S. and abroad. Her essays and interviews on death, history, and ritual through a secular lens have appeared in the, the Cut, O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, Literary Hub, Mashable, Violet Book and Beyond. She regularly speaks on ways science can inform our celebrations and how we can mark the passage of time inspired in part by the work of her parents, Carl Sagan and Drian. Sasha is the author of Four Small Creatures Such as We, Rituals for Finding Meaning in Our Unlikely World, an exploration, the marvels of nature as revealed by science, which require no faith in order to be believed. The book is an exercise in skepticism without cynicism told through memoir and social history. Kierkegaard's review called it profound, elegantly written, renumerations on the exquisite splendors of life. Inverse named Sasha one of their future 50, a group of 50 people who will be the forces of good in the 2020s. She lives in Boston, Massachusetts with her husband and daughter, and you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Sasha Sagan. This is her book, and this is her. Welcome to the show, Sasha. So good Thank to you. see you. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so happy to be here. I uh, told you this in, in, in the pre, and, and I'm so glad to have you here. I've read your book twice. So it's a fabulous work, and um, I, I enjoyed the audio version the best uh, because you read it all. And honest to goodness, uh, I feel like I'm, I know everybody in your family, or, <laughs> you, you know, your great grandparents, your grandparents, your, your, you know, the big history uh, uh, of, of you and your family, which is so beautiful. It's such a nice glimpse into, uh, into your life and, and this big history of, of Sasha Sagan and uh, the journeys and adventures and the experiences you had. Uh, um, everything from a little controversial uh, ex <laughs> drug experiments to <laughs> some sexual lovemaking, you know, and, and some uh, absolutely love it it was so fabulous thank you so much um i don't i i can i don't need to watch any netflix or any series i'm <laughs> totally fulfilled and it, it's right with uh, in line with the with what i what uh, with what i like to read what i like to uh hear about and explore so uh, i i i don't want to make your head blow up but i really enjoyed it thank you so much but it, but it transitions nicely into how we're going to begin our, our dialogue and discussion today. Um, this big history, not all, all, all of our listeners will know of that, but if you could kind of give us a, um, a, a kind of a quick synopsis from, you know, uh, uh, to current, to present, how, how you've gotten here and how, 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 how we've come to, to talk about your book and what's really influenced you, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your very kind words. Um, and it's true. It's so funny when you write something that is partly very personal and then you meet people who have read it. <laughs> there, you have those moments where you think, oh my goodness, they know a lot more about me than I know about them. And that's certainly true of writing a book like this. Um, so my, my work is, as you said in the introduction, is very in, much informed by the work of my parents. Um, my dad was the astronomer and educator Carl Sagan, and he and my mom, Andrianne, together um, wrote many essays and books, and they created the television series Cosmos, um, which aired in the early 80s originally with my dad as the host, um, and now my mom carries on that that legacy um, writing and, and producing uh, the new version with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and my parents really instilled me with this in, and, and many, many other people who, who read their work and watched their show with this sense of awe and wonder about the universe as revealed by science. Um, the sense that um, the more deeply we understand reality and the more information we're able to discern um, the closer we we feel to one another and and that sense of grandeur that we all crave when we feel connected to this vast universe and um they really they really showed me so much delight and joy about science and about following the evidence and looking looking for you know, deep questions and, and finding answers sometimes and sometimes letting that space be open when we don't have the answers yet. And so that's that's how I was brought up. That's my worldview. And then um, when I was 14, my dad died and I started to wonder about how do we grieve and do the other, go through the other rites of passage, the other markers in life, changing of the seasons, celebrations, coming of age, marriage, all of these turning points um, and important moments to process without the infrastructure of religion, because I was brought up in a secular household where science rather than faith was the pathway to, to revelation, for lack of a better word. And so that's sort of where I started to, to think about some of the questions that eventually led to the book. Um, and, you know, for those of us who are, are without faith, um, we still need to celebrate and we still need um, holidays and weddings and funerals. And so I think there's a lot to be explored about how we do that without, without the infrastructure of belief. I totally agree. In your book, you call it cosmic rituals which I totally agree that um, uh, whether we call it a discipline, whether we call it a ritual, um, and how you uh, involve the word cosmic and how that it is much bigger um, a, a, of a thing for us all to really connect to, that it's um, uh, actually something that's very unifying instead of something that separates us from one another as human beings. And then another profound thing in the book is your real poignant uh, way of, and maybe you can say it more eloquently than I, just how love is so important that we not only love our family units, we love each other, we love our earth, we love our, our space, we love everyone. And that, that through that love, that it really fixes a lot of problems. It also uh, helps us uh, uh, on this journey of life a lot yeah. better. But I, I don't know if I'm saying it how you would say it. You say it so eloquently in your book, it's, you know, only through love. Yeah, so the title of the book for small creatures such as we is um, the beginning of a quote from Contact, um, the only novel that my dad ever published, which later became a movie. And it's a line that my parents collaborated on everything. And um, it's a line that uh, my mom actually wrote. And the rest of the line is for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. And that really does encapsulate the ethos that my parents raised me with and this idea that, 
you know, once you get to the other side of the existential crisis, once you reckon with this idea, we're tiny, the universe is big, we live for the blink of an eye, we don't know if there's anything after, and if there is, it's not this. So whatever this is comes to an end. And, um, you know, it's very easy to spiral <laughs> out of control with those ideas, and I get it, and I've, I've been there. Um, I, it is really hard to reckon with that stuff, but then once you sort of get through that crisis, what, what's on the other side? What do we have that, that we can, that's tangible, that's, that we can really show that we have, and it's one another. You know, if we're just on this little lifeboat of a planet in all this vastness in every direction, and we don't know if there's anyone else out there, and we don't know what our fate will be, but we're here right now, and we have one another. And from the, from the perspective of the universe, you know, the things that seem to when we're down here on earth and we see someone from another side of the planet speaks a different language has a different culture it's so easy to get so wrapped up in those differences but from the perspective of the solar system the galaxy the universe those differences are so imperceptible so tiny so irrelevant um and i think that that's one of the great gifts that my dad got from from his work in astronomy and that he passed on to me is as is, is this idea that we are really in it together and the divisions that we create um are artificial in comparison to the reality that we evolved on this planet together and we are the same so it, i mean he your father said so many wonderful things that i absolutely love i'm also a big follower of his works and and try to consume everything that came up. I actually, um, probably in a, a, a much different way, I grew up with Cosmos, your father and your mother's work um, through my father. He, he, we'd watch it as a family all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it, it's a absolute uh, beautiful thing. So the thing that you were just referring to, uh, and I don't know because you're probably more correct on this, is uh, is it where he talks about the pale blue dot and his yeah. kind of discussion about there and how, you know, um, th there's a couple of videos and one, one he's in front of this tree and he's kind of talking about the pale blue dot and he's talking about wars and, and whoever's existed and, and um, goes through the big cosmic perspective of things. Is, is that uh, what you were referring to just now? Yeah, I think that, that that soliloquy, for lack of a better word, word, that, you know, if you Google Carl Sagan, Pale Blue Dot, you can hear, which is so poetic. I mean, it really is like a poem. And the, the, the crux of it is this idea that everyone you, who ever lived, everyone you ever heard of, lived out their lives on this pale blue dot. And it's this image, you know, we're so used to that frame filling image of earth where it feels so important and that's beautiful and it's good we have that but there is another image that is from much further away where the earth is a tiny dot suspended in a sunbeam and um that image which my dad was instrumental in yes, he was. having having that photograph come to fruition you know 40 years ago um, or more. Um, that, I think, that idea that we are on this little, little, little tiny pinpoint in, in all this space, um, in all this darkness, um, I think that, that that really inspired this beautiful um, passage that he wrote. And that passage, I think, crystallizes something that's in so much of his work, so much of my parents' work together, um, that, you know, the, the big the bigger our perspective, the further we zoom out, the more clarity we have about um, how small we are, but also how lucky we are to be in it together. And, you know, one of the things I write about a lot that I'm really interested in is, you know, if you believe everything happens for a reason or everything's destined, then it's it was this moment right here where we're talking, of course it was gonna happen. There was no question. 
But if you think that we are the beneficiaries of a lot of random chance and that a lot of things could have gone differently and that, um, you know, the, the, the idea that even our solar system formed, that life started on Earth, that all the steps that were required for each of us to be born could have gone potentially a different way, um, then I think every moment is so much more special and so much more worthy of celebration. And, you know, maybe, maybe the reality, there's some, some things where, you know, a series of events were set in motion and, and certain things were inevitable and certain things weren't, we don't know. But um, I think there's something about the randomness that's really beautiful. So I, I, I follow your mother still. I follow Neil Tyson de Grassian. Um, I, I don't know if your father said it as well, but Neil Tyson de Grassi, um, I said it several times that for us to just be born is like a, a trillionth of a chance to just even come to this earth and have that opportunity um, to live out this life. And, and um, I, I really believe that we're fortunate. And if we can use those, those moments and also embrace that uh, love to get us through these existential moments or these moments where we're grasped with these enormous things that we just can't comprehend or don't understand the co cosmic perspective on it. I, I don't know if you know I'm an environmentalist, a climate activist, and, and very active around food and our world yeah. and our environment and that is it's an ex existential threat we're yeah. kind of so it's so big that we're like I just I don't know how we're going to do it I don't know how you know once you understand it it, it clicks and you say wow we're really in a, in a weird situation I, I believe your tool your, or your, your, your mantra or how, how you embrace it only through love, you know, only through yeah. love, loving our planet, loving one another through breaking yeah. down nations and borders. That's a fabulous tool to address and solve some of these problems because it makes you an integral part, not only of humanity, homo sapiens, uh, as a symbiotic earth, but also it makes you part of our environment and our world yeah. and, and uh, as our only home, which are many things that your, your father said as well. Yeah. That leads me nicely into the question that I, that I really want to ask. It's one of the first that I kind of ask standardly, and it is, do you feel like you're um, a global citizen? And what if in the future, there were no nations, walls, borders, or division dividing or holding humanity back from one another, or also from interacting with all different parts of our planet. Yeah, I certainly see myself as a earthling first. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that's so crucial in this perspective, especially what we we're just talking about in terms of you know, random chance. If that's the case, then any of us, like myself, who was born into a very lucky set of circumstances, you know, never n talking about food, like never knowing hunger, never having any, you know, never wanting for anything. For those of us who have that, you know, if, if it's all just random chance, then we're just very lucky and it's up to us to create a safety net. If there's not a grand, um, plan and that you know if we don't believe that the bad guys are going to get their comeuppance and the good guys are going to get their reward then for secular people I think there is a call to social justice and to um, you know making the world more fair especially what you're talking about with food you know and it, all the environmental issues that of course will affect people who are impoverished before anyone else, um, you know, those things are all related, all the environmental issues, all the social justice issues, they're all wrapped up together. And if we don't think that, you know, being, if you're lucky enough to be born in a place where there's plenty of food and plenty of jobs um, and somebody else isn't, and it's just random, then it's up to us to create the, the grand safety net that doesn't um, exist if, if our theology or philosophy doesn't, you know, if we don't believe that there is one. And I think that that's something that's often missing from the conversation. Um, but yeah, I think that our idea of identity, you know, and that's one of the things that I think is 
is something that um, when you're secular, you know, you still have this urge to sort of at least connect to your ancestors and have, you know, there may be certain traditions that you love, even if they don't fit philosophically with, you know, your beliefs with the people who, who maybe brought those traditions down, down the generations to you. I think the way that we see ourselves, and especially right now, so entrenched in our identities um, in, in terms of nationalism. I mean, obviously it's a huge problem in the United States. Um, I think that there's, there's so much there that once we take that step back, you know, all of these borders, all of these ideas of being a part of one group or another, that's all temporary. Those change. The things that feel really traditional to us are very new on the scale of human history and they will change. Borders will change, language will change, you know, all these things that seem like the, you know, seem very old and very important will change. But what won't change, you know, is that this is our one planet and, you know, maybe we'll go somewhere else eventually. But right now, this is where we are. This is where we came from. And this is the system, you know, that we have evolved to be part of. And I think that that the more that we see ourselves as part of a whole rather than this little faction and this little group, um, the better off we'll be. I believe you were, as you said, true, truly blessed with the, the right circumstances, but it's a very diverse uh, set of family circumstances, so to say. So if I get it right uh, from, from the book, uh, Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, Orthodox, is it Greek Orthodox? No, Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews, and yeah. then and then also Christian. And my then, husband, my husband's family is Christian. Husband's Christian, mm -hmm. but then the, I thought that. Well, was he's some, not. I mean, we're both secular, yeah, yeah, but yeah, our, both our secular, ancestry, but, so, yeah. yeah, ancestry. Yeah. And then there was there. Then there was something with Russian and Greek somewhere in there as well. Um, so well, maybe, it's well, it, it the the Greek part is maybe what you're getting from is that we are we chose our daughters we, there's a lot Elena. of ancient greek mythology that i i draw from in the book and it was something that fascinated me immensely throughout my childhood um and we chose our daughter's name helena is from helios from the greek sun god but that that's kind of just a that's where I got we're it not from. really greek yeah. Yeah, yeah um but yeah i mean and and the other the other element that i talk about in the book is um in my house growing up, um, the third adult besides my two parents was Maruha Farhe, who was my nanny who lived with us and was a very yeah. close part of um, our lives and was one of the dearest people to me of my whole life. And she was a very devout Roman Catholic. She had been a cloistered nun in the Andes Mountains. Um, and she left her convent, not because of a crisis of faith. She was a true, true believer. Um, I talk a little bit more about her, her life story, but one of the things that was so powerful to me was she was totally, I know, I knew that what she believed and what my parents believed was different and that was not a problem. And I think, and my parents, there was no censorship and it's been really interesting actually, because um, in uh, a lot of the conversations that I've had since the book has come out and some of the interviews I've done with religious um, outlets, media outlets, um, uh, the, th there's some element of surprise that my parents didn't shield me from, from religion. And it's quite the opposite. They would have felt that my education was not complete if I didn't know these grand pillars of civilization that were so central to how we got to this moment as a species. And part of that was, you know, Maruha would take me to church sometimes, and she was very open about her beliefs. And I, uh, I write in the book, one of the most um, meaningful, memorable moments of my childhood was I was sort of um, a little bit morbid and fascinated with death as a child, as I, as I remain. And um, I went to my parents and I said, you know, Maruha says when you die, you go to heaven and you're with God. And you guys say that it's like you're asleep forever without dreaming. Um, you know, who's right? And they said in unison so joyfully, nobody knows. 
And that idea that there are some answers that we don't have, and instead of saying, well, we think we're, it's probably, we're probably right. You know, they, they, they let that space be open for these questions that, you know, in time, every one of us will get the answer, but until then, it's an open question. And I think that that getting used to, my parents would call it, call it tolerating ambiguity. And I think that that is something that's so important in science and so important in life. And that, I think that that was something that was really powerful um, for me as a child. And, and also just this idea that there are infinite number of belief systems throughout history. Um, sorry, there's a train going by. Oh, I don't know if you heard the horn. Oh, um, but, um, you know, that there's an infinite number of ways to look at things and eat and different philosophies and different religions and and even within a, one sect or another there are so many variations that each one of us has to reckon with these deep questions ourselves i think that that's um that's something that it's, it's very easy to say oh this group is all this way and this group is all this way but there's a infinite number of shades of gray. And I think that, you know, we each have to sort of figure out what we want to take from the traditions that we were brought up with and what we want to let fall away. You, um, and I'm kind of leading you in a direction here with the questioning. So you discuss uh, many different religions, not only those ones that you are involved in closely, but you also mentioned the Mormons and some ancient religions as well. Um, which I really like that diversity, the view that you're really taking the, the big, the look at everything and kind of exploring that, understanding that, embracing that as well. Um, you, we said at the beginning that you guys live in, in Boston, Massachusetts. I used to live in, uh, in Beverly, Massachusetts. Oh, so yeah, we have too, friends who live yeah, there, yeah. Not, not too far away. And um, um, my father's American, my mother was German, and my grandparents were German, and uh, relatives Spanish and Italian and, and Austrian. And, and so I'm kind of this global citizen from birth. And, and I see that uh, you and John have a wonderful home for Helena and that uh, this, this nice insight in your book into your family and how you live and the big history and what kind of shaped you and the journey you took of, of discovery. You didn't take everything for face value. You are also uh, very much, let's explore, let's find out what I believe and um, get this cosmic perspective, this uh, cosmic understanding of, of rituals. Um, I, I believe, but I would like to find out that all that has prepared you very well to this last little, I don't know, last little is probably not the right, to the point that we're at now. We've just experienced, you know, this huge pandemic and Black Lives Matters and all sorts of other tumultuous things in our world that are going on and still not over. Uh, yeah, uh, and still going on. Um, now we're seeing some some big things bubbling up on on uh, food security and and, and uh, Lebanon and and yeah, geez, just just you know, it's a it's a crazy time that we're living in. Has any of this past experience given you resilience, hope, um, things to weather the pandemic? And what are they? How have they been? What tools have you used? What things have really helped you to get through this time? And, yeah. and how has it been? How, how, how have you and the family weathered the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, thanks. Thank you for asking. We're fine. You know, it's, it's definitely um, like everyone. It's been difficult. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert, so it's not, <laughs> it's been a little bit difficult in terms of that. Like I like being around people. So but I, we have a wonderful family and we're very lucky and everyone health wise, everyone's been fine. And, and, you know, we're in the grand scheme of things, we're extremely, extremely lucky. So, um, but in terms of this moment, I mean, the two things that come to mind that in turn, that I carry with me from the way I was brought up and, and the way I see the world. Um, one is that we are at this moment where 
you know, science is going to be the way out of this. With this health crisis around the world, you know, no matter what, no matter what, that is the pathway out. And we can't, sometimes it's a really long process. Sometimes it's really difficult. Sometimes there are a lot of false starts, but there is one road out of a plague and it is science and understanding what works and what doesn't. And in this, in the United States, there is a deep fear, I think, of science and a deep skepticism about information um, from the scientific community. And we have a leader who has no grasp of how it works and believes, seems to believe that wishing something makes it so, and you know, says things like it's just gonna go away. And that is so dangerous. And you know, if we had a system in this country where children were brought up with a really strong scientific, uh, not just not just you know an hour a day as part of school, but science as a worldview, as a pathway to scrutinize what can what can stand up to questioning and what cannot. And, and a way of understanding reality, not just like, you know, not just, oh, well, if you're going to go become a biologist or if you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be an astronomer, but as a philosophical perspective that allows you to discern fact from fiction. I think that we would be in a lot better shape um, than we are right now. And so, you know, this, this battle and this, um, moment that that right now is you know people just refusing you know there's so much misinformation there's so many people who um you know in a way it's as a skeptical person and as a person who loves questioning i can't say that i want to discourage people from being skeptical or questioning but i what i want is for people to have the tools to look at the evidence and look at um, who's presenting the evidence and what motives they might have or might not have. And, you know, the thing about science is if you come to it, you know, when people make claims, um, sometimes it's hard to know what's real or what's not real. But when someone has devoted their life to, let's say, the, I don't know, for an example, uh, how viruses spread, <laughs> you know, and that is their area of interest and they don't have a um, horse in the race. It's, you know, it's not that they can't be questioned. Everyone should be questioned, but it, they should be questioned by the people who also have a background in this information and and you know that debate and that testing each other and questioning authority is so powerful but only if you're willing to then look at the answers and see what the information actually is um so that's a huge part of what's going on here and the 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 other half of of that questioning authority and questioning the status quo that's so powerful, I think is so central also to everything that's happening in terms of Black Lives Matter and this reckoning with the extremely, I mean, I'm, excuse my language, but fucked up history of this country. And we, you know, I think again, talking about the things that seem traditional, that we're so afraid to let go of, this country is brand new, you know, in the scope of things. There is nothing that is so old that we have to hang on to it. Change is inevitable and it's constant. The only question is what kind of change do we want? And when I see this, you know, obviously the movement for civil rights and social justice is centuries long in this country and some progress has been made, but not enough. And I think that this, the, the idea that, you know, as a value, science as a value has this idea of questioning, why are things the way they are? What, why is the status quo the way it is? Why do we believe what we believe? Um, and, you know, my parents would always say, you're a better scientist if you prove that those who came before you were wrong. 
you know, that's, that's an achievement. And I think that there's something really valuable about bringing that mindset to also, you know, history and looking at why are things the way they are in this country. And once you start to dive into the history of it and you can understand that this is a nation and listen, I've lived here for the majority of my life. I lived abroad for two years, but mostly I've lived here. There are amazing things about this country. Um, I often feel lucky to live here, but um, we're not perfect. And the pre pretense that we're perfect and that this country is the best country in the world and the only place where people, you know, can have these, you know, great dreams of, of grandeur and all these, you know, is so, it's so dangerous to be trapped in this prison where we cannot admit that we are wrong and we are damaged and we have these deep, deep, deep centuries old flaws that we have to reckon with. And so my hope is that we're at a moment where even if the people, you know, my age and older can't face this, that the young people, um, people who are growing up at this moment and who are growing up understanding that the system is flawed, um, will we'll make, make a real change and that that's something that, you know, we, we can see in the coming decades. Well, I think you're almost taking me down a whole nother rabbit hole. That's <laughs> not that's not quite where I where I was leading you or where I wanted to go. But I thank you for for that view. Um, I, I have to agree with you. Um, it's not just the U.S. There's a lot of uh, world leaders, you know, whether it's the yes. Trump apocalypse, the Putins, the Shays, the Erdogans, mm -hmm. the Bolsonaros, uh, uh, on and on that we feel this unrest, this uh, um, civilization framework that is failing humanity yeah. in many respects. It's not working for us all. So I'm totally in alignment um, with you there and that, that a, something new needs to emerge while we uh, spin the plate and keep the, the, the bad one still functioning as long as we can transition to something new. Um, I definitely don't believe we should go back to normal. Uh, it needs to be a, a great reset, something new that we yeah. need to use the science and the mass and and really uh, catapult us into the 21st century that we've been talking about for so long. Yeah. The 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 visions and and uh, dreams, the eloquent way your your father and mother put things there, even in your book, the way you do it. Um, for me, make it easy to imagine and envision a, a resilient, desirable future. What, what a beautiful future could look like with family and nature and environment and how you can have these cosmic rituals of, of, a, of a bright future. And I really feel that that is something that is lacking today. We see a lot of media, uh, besides from your mother, besides from Cosmos and, and uh, Neil Tyson and, and a few other spots, that is very dystopian. It's very sci-fi in a negative way or very dystopian fighting over water and resources and yeah. you know, um, water world terminator what, whatever yeah the, mad max yeah. mad max you yeah. know a black mirror um it's all pretty dystopian and so because we don't have these beautiful images or media or 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 content that is constantly streaming in front of us whether it's netflix or amazon prime or tv or whatever the movies are um it's failing us to have a nice, beautiful vision of how to engineer, how to create, how to architect for that future, because we don't even, uh, the current visions, even if it is moving magic, it's all dystopian. So how, you know, I mean, we can, we can create dystopian, but how do we know how to create that future? And when I was younger, Star Trek, obviously, and things your father, things that Nick uh, does as yeah. well. Um, you know, kind of in gaming and, and books and, and things. Uh, who's your brother for the listeners? Yes, who, yes, who, my who brother Nick, yeah. amazing writer. But but, but uh, to create these futures that 
that we can start to engineer, create, and 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 strive towards reaching. You know, yeah. Instead, it's all satire. And so the 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 real question and where I was trying to lead you uh, is um, that of your past and what you've experienced, and even during this pandemic, I yeah. You've applied some of those things. You've been in yeah. a better position as a family, as a unit, yeah. to help others, to maybe have those discussions with others, or to give them tools and say, hey, you know what? I, I'm doing pretty good. Let me help you if you need food, if you need resources. Let me yeah. help you if you need advice. And um, that was really what I'm trying to pull out of you because you are the you know, TV, film, writer, producer. You know how to have these visions and you've thought of these big questions. And, um, and so if, if there's some wisdoms or, or things that, whether it's from your book or just in this yeah. time that really need to come out, that's what I want to hear or want yeah. our listeners to know. It's so true. And it, I think so often, you know, art comes from our fears or, you know, it comes, I mean, right. It comes from what, you know, the drama of a television series or something like that comes out of the, the, the feeling of fear of what's going to happen. And it's maybe it's a little bit harder to have um, an ongoing series of a utopia as opposed to a dystopia. But I think that one of the things I've seen that's been so fascinating um, is so many people I know have, you know, and I, I live in Boston now and, and I lived in, in New York for most of my adult life and I lived in London and I, I really think of myself as a city person. But during this pandemic, myself and so many other people I know who live in large cities have chat, suddenly felt this overwhelming desire to be in nature in a way that I've never heard um, them talk and I've never, I mean, I, I've felt that way from time to time. And I, I like, I love like, you know, the ocean I feel very connected to, but this sense of like, I want to be in a forest as much as possible. And so one of the rituals that my husband and daughter and I started um, is every weekend we started going on a hike in, and there's a national park not far from here that, you know, the facilities were closed, but the trail stayed open. It was very easy to stay, you know, six or 30 feet away from anyone else. And we started doing that every weekend. And um, it was absolutely magical. And our daughter started saying, you know, when everything goes back to normal, can we still go to the forest? And we're like, yes. And, you know, normally we would have gone to museums and the aquarium and that sort of thing every weekend. But because everything was closed, um, we started this other tradition. And I think it really meant a lot, means a lot to all three of us. And it really tapped into something that that is there. And I think that, you know, one of the things I write about, and I think one of the things that um, I'm really fascinated with is the way all of our traditions and holidays and the markers that we have throughout our, our lives, no matter what the specifics of the culture or tradition or religion require, there is a biological or astronomical event that is underneath, whether it's the solstices and the equinoxes or, you know, birth coming of age, which is, you know, it's very easy when you're at a bat mitzvah or a quinceanera or, you know, a, a sweet 16 to not think of it as a biological event, but it's a child is going through puberty and becoming an adult, that's what we're celebrating. That's what is so amazing. And, you know, and a, and fun a funeral is also about a biological event. And I think that, you know, it's not as, we're not as removed as we seem to be from our connections to the natural world. We just sometimes have to peel back the curtain a little bit and see what's, what's really there. And I think that in this moment where everything is on hold and all the normal rhythms of life are just, you know, impossible to experience, um, there's so much that we're realizing is important to us. And I think that so much of it has to do with our 
connections to the natural world. And, you know, all of a sudden, I think, you know, people are appreciating like a sunset so much more than they used to. And, you know, and I think that my hope is that this global step back from the everyday um, will give us a, a chance to, to really examine what we value and um, what's important to us. And I think that a lot of people who maybe otherwise might not have felt this way are, are really having a deep connection with the natural world. Boy, you've touched on so many things there that I could really, we could really go down some rabbit holes. I want yeah. to kind of, kind of maybe tickle the surface of a couple of them, um, mm. whether you need to make a comment about them or not. So I, I truly believe that the pandemic and uh, what we're experiencing is closely tied to the biome of our earth. Uh, yeah. which is tied to our biome, our, our, our uh, physiological and biome of our gut and our, our health uh, as human beings are, are very closely interlinked. Um, and that, that biome is, is not only kind of doing a seasonal reset, but also this, what you also tickled or teased about this rite of passage, the sweet 16, the, and you also discuss this in, in, in your book. Um, this might be a way that the Earth's saying, okay, it's time for humanity, for Homo sapiens, to have a new form of rite of passage. We need to transition to another form of living to connect our personal biomes with the Earth biome or realize that they are connected already. And that if our, our Earth, our planet's suffering, that uh, that that's really going to affect us and how human health is and also how, how long our lifespan could be and, and remain the way we are. So right now we're in this social distancing and, and wearing masks uh, scenario. I, I can't think of too many scenarios in our world where we've had uh, situations or pandemics, whether it's Ebola, SARS, MERS, or, or, or whatever it may be, that we haven't went, when the next one has occurred, that we've actually taken a step back and say, oh, this time we don't need masks. So currently the model that we're operating on is face masks, distancing, hand washing, personal protection equipment, things like that, uh, just con you know, hopefully common sense in some of hopefully. us. Um, yeah, hopefully <laughs> uh, for for some of us. Um, um, but the next step would be so a gas mask. The next step would be an oxygen mask. The next step would be a spacesuit. The next step would maybe we're living in bubbles. Maybe we don't go out all together. Now we're investing in air purifiers and certain things. What actions? What things are we taking? What rite of passage or in this great reset like the World Economic Forum is talking about instead of going back to normal or going back to old models? What are we doing to make sure that the, the next time or, or the future is much brighter so that we're not taking more measures? Now you've got to have Helena wear a gas mask and the whole family and she can't kiss grandma and grandpa and uh, you know your uh, grandma and and uh, go about life as uh, uh, as a beautiful future, and so I, I, there might be something in that, but there there might not. And I believe that you you've had some of these resilience and the wisdoms, and you 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 nicely mentioned them. But that brings me you can make a comment or not, but that brings me to my to the next question, and it's the biggest, uh, probably the most difficult question I ask. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? So yeah. having caveated that with, you know, the trajectory, the plan, the path we're going on, do you have one for you, your family, or, or, or your view? You don't have to do it for the whole world. It's just, what's the future? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, we human beings like wrestle with that question every day in small and large ways. And I think, you know, the only clues that we have are the past. And 
I see both. I see, you know, millennia long periods of deep um, backwardsness, if that's a word, um, um, you know, that happens. We go down these roads that, that really, you know, historically have, have led nowhere and have, have not been moments of advancement, but have been moments of, of, of going backwards or standing still. And, you know, I think about like the bubonic plague and those moments in, in the Middle Ages where there, we were stuck for a long time, you know, in parts, or in Europe at least. And I then I also think about these moments of great flourishing and um, scientific, artistic advancement where we really did solve some of the problems of the past and, and didn't go back. And I just think, you know, I go back to what my parents taught me about tolerating ambiguity. I, <laughs> a lowly human on this, dot um, cannot predict the future. All I feel I can do is within my family, within my community, you know, um, thanks to the magic of social media and other technological and scientific advancements, you know, the small way that I can connect with people around the world, like we're doing right now. Um, it's all I can do is put forth the positive, constructive, pro-scientific, um, view that I have and try to help in the small ways that I can as one individual. But, you know, it's like the thing about like the best way to predict the future is to make it. And I think that that's, that's up to us. And, you know, the, one of the things that's been so astonishing in this moment, and one of the things that I've been totally obsessed by is all the anecdotal evidence of like, now that, you know, the daily pollution has gone down so much and there are fewer flights and fewer cars on the road, all these places where, you know, animals are coming out of the woodwork and, and something that was, you know, totally polluted has managed to clean itself out. And, you know, all these like stories from around the world where someone's, you know, just, you know, oh, there's just wild boars walking down the street in Madrid or whatever it is gives me so much hope that we're not as far away, especially with the climate change and environmental issues, that it's not too late. We can make changes and that the earth and the ecosystems and are so powerful that they have the ability, given even just a tiny chance, to rebuild and that we can reset in a real way. But we just have to collectively make that decision. And, you know, I think information, education, teaching children about these issues from a young age and teaching them how to discern what's real and what's not through the scientific method is a central element of that. And I think that, you know, I'm a hopeful person. And so my, um, my inclination is to veer towards a positive, more utopian, less dystopian future, but um, only time will tell. I, um, I agree with you on some of those points. It's um, wonderful because through this pause and reset, numerous fabulous things have happened. It's been, it's been great. Um, it's not enough. Even if we now yeah. were forced on a longer pause, yeah. um, the, the, earth would, the earth would do it. But what you said is if we unite, if we make that decision, if we help and leave our planet better than we found it and proactively yeah. clean up and take part in this symbiotic earth. Just imagine how exponentially that would grow, how quickly yeah. we would see the results if we actually tried to help it instead of just or forced in, in this lockdown modus. The, the, other, the other interesting thing that ties to this global citizenry, and I don't know if you thought about it, the only thing that wasn't locked down during this time was food. During yeah. this great pandemic uh, and lockdown period, that was the only thing that was still moving, traveling around, being distributed. And there was numerous problems for that. Obviously, we, we know why, but uh, food is the global citizen. And uh, we uh, need a global food reform because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two layers are breathing food, water, 
uh, resource of body, resources, uh, security, health, and uh, um, those are all so important, but they're also food. That, that's the basic need, our, our energy source. Uh, and so we need as food also to make sure that human beings can move around our planet, clean it up, make it better, and that we don't progress this these pandemics, these problems, and a lot of them have to do with whether we would have had the lockdown um, uh, early enough, five to 10 days, the, the, the uh, virus would have spread via the air regardless to other places without air travel, without ship travel, um, because of the airstreams and the flows of our planet. Um, I want to move into a different direction now, um, and, and that is one that you also touch a lot of, upon in your, your book. Uh, you do it in a different way. You talk about rituals, you talk about religions, you talk about the infrastructures that religions provide and um, kind of how they help. I also um, agree to those but I am more on this um, Joseph Campbell camp. I am big on mm. mytho mythology. Uh, and you said you're also big on mythology. I believe that, that religion is a mythology. It's a super guide uh, uh, for humanity and help. But we can also see the ruins of, of mythology all around the world where they haven't evolved, where they haven't progressed with our world and collapsed, whether um, it's the... 12 plus world civilizations that don't exist anymore today, earlier Mesopotamia, early antiquity, oh, uh, so the many, Greeks, yeah. the Romans, you know, more than 12 of them and um, all but two of them really collapsed because of an ecological and environmental collapse. And so I, um, that also ties to this civilization framework that we tickled the surface on, but in, mythology um it is a type of plan it's a type of um, guideline and infrastructure as you mentioned infrastructure for religion to guide us to where the future is going to be to give us hold to know how to organize ourselves or kind of how to act as human beings um, do you believe that there is a, a plan for the future even to 2030 to 2050 some new form of world mythology or since you since you've delved into the past mythologies and religions um, do you see any great plan for our world emerging where we're going and how we can get there well i think that mythology you know i don't really delineate between what we might call mythology and what we might call religion i you know, I think there are beautiful, stirring, profound metaphors um, and stories that reveal something about ourselves that we tell ourselves. And I think that's great and important, but I think it's when we take them literally that we get ourselves into trouble rather than this idea that this is, you know, um, the historian of religion, Karen Armstrong, talks about everyone, um, this this idea that a, a myth is happening all the time and never. It's not literally, it's just not a historical event, but it's this, this um, idea that we can relate to just like other forms of fiction that are profound and meaningful and revealing, but we don't take literally. So I think that, you know, all of these stories are really important to us. And I think everyone is you know, navigating their traditions and beliefs and the things they want to carry on from their ancestors. And, you know, religions and belief systems are built atop previous religions and belief systems. You know, there's almost nothing comes from scratch. You know, we are, we are just, you know, taking the threads of historical, um, moments um, and historical ideas and adapting them sometimes for what we need in the present. And, 
you know, no matter how, how traditional and devout you are, what you're doing is still totally different than what people were doing a thousand years ago. And, um, and that's okay. That's fine. You know? And I think that in terms of where we'll go forward, it's really hard to predict these things. It's really hard to know what, people will believe in the future. I think we have this tendency, especially secular people to think, oh, well now people are becoming less and less religious and that's gonna go away. I think it's unlikely that that sort of thing goes away. I think it ebbs and flows with people's needs. It changes, of course, but I think that um, it's more likely to be um, a, a cyclical thing than a permanent change. Um, but my hope is that there's a future where the thrill and the connectedness and that like hair standing up on the back of your neck feeling that people we all crave whether we're secular or religious um that for those of us who do not have faith that is available through our understanding of the natural world as it is and you know i think about like when those first images of the black hole came or just even standing and looking up on a clear night at the night sky and seeing the stars and like or seeing a shooting star or seeing an eclipse or just being in a forest or being in the ocean and like those feelings of I mean it's really hard to not for me at least it's really hard to not use the language of belief when I think about those things it feels sacred it feels spiritual and I think that that I just hope that that is an avenue available to people who are skeptical or, you know, uh, on the fence or who are just secular. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's my job to dissuade anyone from their belief. But if you, if you still need that feeling and crave that feeling of being part of this planet and universe, um, I just hope that people realize how how possible it is to feel fulfilled with that um, from a scientific worldview and, you know, something that celebrates things as, as they are when, you know, supported by evidence. I agree. So I, I want to refer to some quotes and comments and, and that, that your, your father mentioned that uh, have helped me over the years that I use in my, my climate presentations. And, and when, I, when I speak in my own mythology, I'm kind of like this climate environmental evangelist, almost like a religion in, in some yeah. respects, but I'm not, I try not to be too extreme with it. Um, and it's another form of saving people. It is another form of saving people. I, I get a lot. I just barely cut my, my beard and hair. I used to get a lot of comments about looking <laughs> at Jesus or Moses and all sorts That's of good. things. So it's, a, a, you know, the, the, the climate savior. Um, <laughs> many things. So your father said, uh, the sun and stars, we are their children. He also said something similar to that, that, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Yeah. And the ones, the, the, the quotes that I really use a lot when, and I use them right in the beginning because I talk a lot about this overview effect, cosmic perspective, the pale blue dot, the earth rise image and things like that, which your father was very instrumental in that whole uh, opening up so many doors of our world of the future of space travel and, and, and things that we have there. The one that I use the most is um, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, carbon in our apple pies are all made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are all made of star stuff. And you also, I believe, mentioned this as well and uh, are very familiar with it. You probably have deeper insight than I am. I truly believe that. And yeah. the reason I do is because the birth of our planet, if you look at uh, the, the way uh, um, we, we weren't born somewhere else, we're born of this earth, we're born of this star stuff that is made up of our earth. And, and your father said it, so eloquently, if we want to make an apple pie from scratch, we need to first create the universe. 
Yeah. And uh, that is, uh, in many respects, my my religion, my view. Yeah. Uh, that I am deeply ingrained and connected to this earth as a. Uh, what Professor Chin uh, said that we need to evolve from Homo sapiens to Homo symbiote, uh, symbiose, kind of this integral part of a, a symbi symbiotic Earth, and that we need to move in that that direction. And um, that that also that symbiotic Earth. I don't know if you if you're aware that has also ties to your father and and his first wife Lynn Margulis mm -hmm. and. and and uh, yeah. uh, also many, many different things in that and uh, um, uh, that are all so wonderful. And you're surrounded by, you know, brothers and, and your mother and your father and all these wonderful wisdoms and connections that I really believe that as, as we come to that realization, and as we come to this transition, which the, the, the wisdom of what he said that it changes our mythology, our cosmic ritual of how we live out our days so that we can be sustainable and be around for multiple generations. Um, um, it's, I guess it's only one generation since, you, since your father's been gone, maybe two because you've got Helena now, but, um, but um, uh, the impact that he had and the ones that went before him and even Neil Tyson and your mother and those are going to be impacting us sustainably for many generations to come. And these wisdoms and this knowledge give us a guide, give us, uh, give us some hold and, and some wisdom to help us navigate this ex existential crisis, the, the, embrace death and, and, and that, but also embrace how we interact with our, interplanetary our galaxy with our world and so on um that that really drives me drives me or leads me to the second most um and last uh, important question that i want to ask you and it's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you oh that's such a good question well i think that you know, a world where we have, the, I mean, talking about food, especially, we have the resources to feed everyone. You know, we have the ability to do that. And we just, a world that works for everyone is a world where we value equally distributing the basic, <clears throat> excuse me, the basic needs of life, food, medical care, you know, education, I think it's a world where teachers are paid a ton of money, you know, where that's something that we agree is like one of the best things you can do. And it's a world where no matter what the circumstances of your birth are, you have the tools to get, through, you know, get to adulthood safely and well-educated. And, you know, that to me is, 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 the, is the crux of it is that every child is born in a world where no, where they live is not going to be the, or what they look like is not going to be the determining factor of how their life goes. And where someone doesn't have to, a child doesn't have to work 10 times as hard to get to where another child starts. Um, I think that that's, that that's a world that works for everyone. And it's not that we don't have differences. It's not that we're all the same. It's not that we all believe the same thing or have the same traditions or celebrate the same things, but it's that we all have the same chance. And I think that that is, that is the world that, that I would like to see evolve. That would, that, that would be the greatest. What I hear out of that is not, not necessarily a universal basic income, but a universal global operating system that you can still have your culture, your nations, your cities, your, your, your whatever divisions, but the standard operating system for humanity, the basic needs that people need and, and education is, is really vital, that that bar is raised much higher for all of us and, and it will not only get us further into the future because we'll have more wisdom to not make the same yeah. mistakes, but it will also 
real really help us. That's how that's what I hear out of that. I don't yeah. want to twist your words, but no, I, it's I, true. And and just the idea that how many children who might have grown up to solve some of our deepest hardest questions just never got the chance because they were girls or they lived in a place where they didn't have access to secondary education or they weren't didn't have access to just some something that somewhere else is just um considered basic and i just think of how how much further along we might be if every every child in the world had the chance to you know if go to the best university if they can if if, if they're cut out for that or or just at the very least um learn and eat and be physically safe um in a place where where their safety um and is not in question yeah and that really is something that needs to occur at a very young age younger years good health so there's no stunting no malnutrition so right. that the, that they have the lighting and energy and the resources to, to learn and to actually, instead of hauling water or whatever they may be doing, that they have the ability to learn and, and, and receive an education at a, at a standard level. I, I don't know if this is correct, but uh, I see you as such. Um, I, I say a lot that you know people and the UN and the World Economic Forum for many years when you'd say, well, how do we solve this, you know, this crisis, the climate crisis? How do we fix our uh, global warming? Um, we're very hard pressed to give you the, you know, the top five things that you could do. Um, since Paul Hawkins' book came out, Draw Down, and uh, there's been much more awareness, but you'd be surprised how many people still don't know. I try to let everybody know that the top four things are um, that are really vital to uh, to fixing some of the problems we have that ties in, in intrinsically to to education. What you discussed and this basic operating system or the basic needs of of humanity. Number one and the first and foremost is to globally reform food so that we have healthy and nutritious food and that everybody does not need to worry about food and yeah. where it comes from and that it's that it's healthy and nutritious and that that entire global food system is reformed that we're not wasting food and, and things like that the second and third are in my opinion almost more powerful because they really tie into the first the second is to empower women and the third is to empower girls um, most people don't know that the majority of women and girls on our planet are the harvesters, the food producers, the farmers, the, those who are serving, making foods, and they're also the ones who are starving, underpaid, who, because as a girl, as a small child, they don't get to go to school because they have to right. work on the farm to just get the basic needs uh, that they need or be at a street vendor or whatever aspect of the global food system that they work in and the fourth is to rethink refrigeration so mm -hmm. in the past a lot of people would say it's all oh, it's we need to get on renewables we need to get rid of oil coal and gas fossil fuel industry we need to get on some kind of other form of energy and uh, you know the telco and, and the automotive industry are big players they're on the list, don't get me wrong, but they are much lower on the list, those top ones and the ones that involve you. And I hope you're doing this not only with your book, but with the things that you do when you speak around the world, that you're really teaching all women and girls how to be empowered, how of a big impact it has, well over 75% to better our planet for the future. When you're paid a fair wage, when you're allowed to go to school, when you have enough food to eat. Um, it's in my mind, it's mind boggling that uh, the majority of farmers and food producers are already starving themselves. Yeah. Which is it's just a mind blowing thing. But so it's heartbreaking. I, 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 I don't know. I somehow feel that you're, it's not a religious feeling, but it's a feeling that you empower women in, in your own way and that I've heard some of your other talks and your movements and the way you speak about your daughter and things. I, I think you're an inspiration to many others and that's through 
probably through years of wisdom and learning uh, uh, from from your family and many other things. But uh, I really enjoyed our time talking, and, and I only have two little last uh, yeah last questions. And, and you're welcome to ask me anything you want as well. If you have some questions about this n this new person who knows a lot more about you <laughs> than you know about him. <laughs> Um, and that is, uh, if you were to give or have the ability to go up, you know, you've written your book, but if you were to have the ability to go up to every individual on our planet and just give them one elevator pitch, quick message, that is your sustainable takeaway. That's something that would empower them or change their life or something you've learned or wisdom that you would like to depart because that wisdom would better our world or make you feel better or what, whatever it is, what would that be? Oh, it's such a good question. Oh, there's, there's more than a few you things. Take, you can I take would... <laughs> as much time as you want. No, I mean, I like the challenge of the elevator pitch. I think um, uh, the two things I would say, if it's two things, one would be, uh, questioning and following the evidence is the pathway to the future. That is how we've gotten as far as we have as, as a species, and it's a good thing. And asking deep questions is, is, is valuable. And um, the other thing I would say is, you know, as, as, as I said earlier, the divisions between groups of people that seem really important are artificial and minute compared to what we share. And if we have the perspective of, of the pale blue dot of, of zooming out, we can realize that we are all in it together. And we're so, so, so astonishingly similar that if anyone came from the outside, they would not be able to detect the differences that we seem to think are very important. If there was aliens that came here, they're like, why are you guys fighting against each other? Why are you all divided? Are you guys are all the same. I mean, yeah, right. I, I, yeah I agree. Um, your book, uh, though it was a deep dive for me into your family, into your thoughts and uh, mythology and rituals and religion and, and, and many other wonderful wisdoms, I almost felt like you probably have enough content for seven other books to come <laughs> out that, that there are some things that probably have emerged and, and you could actually branch off into a lot of other areas. I hope that is the case and that we see many other works from you or maybe we could collaborate on, 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 a, on some good media content for our world to show them a future that, that is desirable to live in that we can create and build from. Um, is, is there anything like that that has emerged that, that you're saying, yeah, I could, uh, it was hard. This I had to leave out. This I could have done, you know. Yeah, I mean, I have some some things in the works that I'm excited about, and some things I want to do. Um, I, I one thing I would really like to do is write a children's book that has some of the themes that are in my book, and and just this idea that you know what we're celebrating so often is so scientific, and that, you know, if we, if we explained um, some of our holidays and rituals to children from this perspective of, this is part of nature, this is part of, you know, the, the world and the universe um, and our bodies, um, and that that alone, just being here alive on this planet is, is worthy of celebration. Sasha, thank you so much for your time. And is there anything you want to ask me or anything that we didn't discuss that you want to get out before I say my goodbyes? <laughs> no, I, I loved this conversation. It was wonderful. I guess I'll ask you this. So in terms of food sustainability, what is the one thing that um, people who, you know, in their everyday lives, what decisions can they make when they go to the grocery store um, that would help? Thank you for that question. That, that's wonderful. So uh, really a food system 
is very complex. It's multifaceted. So there's not just one aspect. I mean, if you, that, that's a big problem that we have in our world. We take this linear and siloed approach to solving our grand challenges. So we say, okay, this is a big one. You'll, you'll probably get it right away when I mention it. That if we all went vegan, that would really solve yeah. the problem. It'd be a big, big yeah. drawdown. It'd be a big thing. It's one tool in, in the toolbox that would help, but it's, it's not the biggest tool in the toolbox. Uh, it's really a multifaceted approach that um, we need to take to, to draw down and fix, fix that problem. The, the great thing is, is it's not only food is something that can also be considered a ritual, a tradition, yeah. uh, um, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas yeah. and on and on um, that uh, can be very, very profound and have an impact. But it's something that we do three times a day. The reason we do it is because we need energy to regulate our body temperature at uh, uh, a certain degree and we need to eat food in order to do that. If we don't, then uh, we're not gonna have any energy to do anything. And so because we all have to do it every single day, it's something that every one of us can have an impact on. And it's really specific to where you live and where you're at, how that works. I really like this zero waste movement that the, the products that you buy don't buy them in any packaging. Yeah. You know, leave the packaging there for someone else to deal with or eventually the producers to realize yeah. we're going to do a different system that doesn't come back to harm our planet because yeah. we're on this planet of finite resources. That's a big movement I like. And the other, the other big movement I really like is this um, no food waste movement around and it's more so not so in the consumer side but that that plays a little part it's in the production part yeah. what worldwide we're wasting more than 40 percent of all the food we we produce and just recently with the brexit um we're actually we're actually wasting a lot more because of lockdown um and we're seeing this all over the world, but it was hardest felt in during the Brexit in the United Kingdom and, and still is. Uh, they voted for the Brexit to not have immigrant workers come in to harvest the food, right? In hopes that all those people would then take the jobs of the immigrant right. workers. Well, those jobs were never taken. And so now right. 200 plus 100,000 uh, or, or more, Clara, I've heard numbers up to 600,000. And migrant workers who go there every year to harvest the food aren't there. So that food is now had been uh. tilled, tilled back into the ground and wasted. So not only uh. the water, the resources all around that. And so it's an exponential waste. The, the other thing is this figure of uh, food waste that's globally is 40% that we waste of everything we produce. That's, that's a, the, that figure is hard to understand because it's really not 40%. It's a, it's a waste of all the finite resources that went into that 40%, the water, the right. sun, the labor, marketing, transport, logistics, the emissions that were created with that. And then, then when we throw it away, it turns into an exponential waste. It turns into methane because the top three ways that we get rid of food waste is we, we bury it, we burn it, or we throw it in our oceans. And the top way when we bury it is actually the worst way because it aggregates, it turns into methane. Methane is 80 times more effective at, at producing heat and it has a, it's, a, it's a more potent greenhouse gas in the short-term effect, more so than uh, carbon dioxide be, and then CO2. And so now it's not just 40%, it's an exponential waste that on a finite planet is just unsustainable. And when you take that cosmic perspective, that view of Earth, from outer space, there is no throw away. Nothing that we yeah. throw away can leave this planet. Even if we burn it, it turns into a greenhouse gas um, right. and it comes back to bite us or to hurt us. And so uh, um, as an individual, thinking about dehydrating, preserving, doing a sprouting, vertical garden in your house, um, doing composting, have a vic victory garden. Those are just a few of, um, 10 dozen other tips yeah. that I could give you. There's a lot of things to do, but it's more important to, 
to take this step back and take this big picture of what you're putting in your mouth, where it comes from, how it's produced, was the person who produced it paid a fair wage or was it right. some girl somewhere who's not going to get to go to school because she's producing your mangoes or your right. cashews, things like that. So that's, right. those are important things. Sorry to go off on a tangent. No, that's really but interesting. But that's something that I'm very passionate about, could talk days on. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's multifaceted. It's not something you do in an elevator pitch or just the, the quick silver bullet. Right. That we need to understand the complexity around it. And that's how we'll truly solve the problem. But I thank you so much for your time, Sasha. And it was a sheer blessing to have you on the show. And and I hope we can continue maybe next year and see where you're at and get an update on what's going on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. This was really a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.